Paul Murphy. Nicole Cullen. Here. Santana Elliott. Here. Kathy Cox. Here. John Maston. Here. Lisa Ramon. Here. Join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do I have a motion to review and accept the agenda for this session? So moved. Second. Archana Aliar? Yes. Nicole Cullen? Yes. Doug Maston? Yes. Kathy Fox? Yes. Lisa Ramon? Yes. I have a request to um, switch up the order a little bit and move to item 3.6 to talk about the benefits recommendations because the person is here who can make that presentation. Is that okay with everyone? You are Mr. Collins, is that, that correct? That would be me, Madam Chairman. Okay. Uh, members of the board, uh, for the record, my name is Aaron Collins, I'm the president of Aaron Collins Associates. We are the benefit consultant to the Lake Havasu Schools Employee Benefit Trust and also the administrator for the uh, Northwest Arizona Employee Benefit Trust. And my charge tonight is to provide an overview of uh, the trust and the offer of membership that was extended to the school district and to answer any questions. Um, I'm happy to take a long way or at the end and whatever is your pleasure, Madam President. Please take it away. Okay, so uh, as background, the uh, Northwest Arizona Employee Benefit Trust was formed back in 2012, July 1 of 2012, by the cities of Bullhead City, Lake Havasu City, and Kingman. Uh, it's formed under ARS 11952.01, which is essentially a, uh, a joint exercise of authority statute that allows public entities in the state of Arizona to come together to form trusts. The key difference between what the district is doing today uh, and what this organization is doing is that the district essentially creates or is operating a, a single entity, a single employer, it's a mini insurance company, in effect. And the district bears all of the financial uh, opportunity and risk that goes with doing that. Whereas the trust that the three cities are in um, essentially spreads the risk amongst all of those organizations. The trust membership is open to all public entities that are allowed under that statute to come together pretty much along the Colorado River, we based, basically from Parker up to uh, the Cayman area. It currently covers about 1,070 employees, about 2,600 total members. <coughs> Pardon me. It has two medical plans, uh, both through Blue Cross and uh, Blue Cross in Arizona, and also they have access to the Blue Cross system nationwide. It offers two plans, an exclusive provider organization, which looks a little bit like the old PPOs, uh, but only has coverage in network, and then a high deductible health plan with uh, health savings account. Uh, a, a big difference, the material one I would call out, uh, is that the district's current program A was just a network provider for basically for everything. Uh, for any EDT, that coverage is limited to transplants and emergencies that are covered under federal law. It's a dental plan, a vision plan, life insurance, telemedicine, pretty much straightforward, employee assistance program through EAP preferred, and then a wellness and health promotion um, entire program covering chronic disease management, early detection um, uh, offered through our company. Since its founding back in uh, 2012, the NADT rates have changed by uh, less than 4% a year, so 3.95 on the high deductible health plan, including benefit improvements that were made back in the current year, and then uh, by 3 three and a third percent uh, on the EPO, which included a 3% upward adjustment in the rates to basically build surplus. So the rates have been remarkably stable for the group, and I think that's more a reflection of the size. Uh, whatever mechanism this organization, the school district chooses, or, or the cities choose, none of them are going are to make it very healthy. It's just not the way it works. Literally all they do is the economies of scale is spreading the risk financially over a larger population and it tends to give you a greater degree of stability. Uh, governance for NAEDT, similar to the district's, Current structure. Uh, the trust is, is governed by the Board of Trustees or legal fiduciaries. Uh, each entity gets to appoint one trustee and one alternate. Uh, by, by structure, the, the trustee has to be the CEO of the organization, and the alternate is typically has to be a higher senior level manager, uh, typically the HR or equivalent. 
and the other three organizations. And what this reflects is that when the trust comes together, whoever's casting the vote for each of the members, has to essentially have the authority to bind the organization. You can't have three or four entities saying, wait, I go back and check. You know, you can get back and forth and everything done. So that's big where that comes from. Membership terms are three years in, three years out. So essentially, you come in, you're in for three, and then if you leave under any particular reason, you have to stay out for three. And the rationale for that is they don't want um, this pool created by public entities to be used as a lever against insurance companies. So what we say internally in, in a very unsophisticated way is this is not holding hands and singing kumbaya. This is linking wallets. Uh, and they're all taxpayer dollars. So you try to do everything you can to get that financial stability built in. There is a surplus in NAEBT today, um, but you no know new members are not required to buy any of those. They do not have to make a deposit on the way in. Instead, their share of any surplus or deficits, deficits um, uh, accrues on their first day. And that literally occurs by month. So every month there's either a surplus or deficit. It drops into each individual entity's account. Um, interest is even allocated based on those accounts. <laughs> The meetings are subject to the Arizona the meeting law. Um, and then in terms of the financial oversight, <coughs> excuse me, in addition to the, to the fiduciaries, uh, the trustees, subject to annual independent audit. And then every five years, the Arizona Department of Insurance comes in uh, and does, frankly, a fairly extraordinary um, examination, uh, very much like a forensic audit. These, all of these pools tend to be small enough that they tend to get out of the transaction level. Uh, what they're primarily looking for is uh, financial solvency and an effective management of financial controls. All the contracts are awarded through competitive process, and all those contracts are held in the name of the trust, and that's fairly significant. I think the district is aware from its own history. Um, you want to make sure that no one but the district, uh, or excuse me, in this case, the trust, has their names controlling the contracts, because whose name the contract is controls the data, controls the information, controls the money flows. So all the contracts are called in the name of the trust. I realize I'm sitting here talking and not going on. Okay, so this is the organization chart for the trust. And again, very similar uh, to what the district has. The always, always, always the top box is the beneficiaries of the trust because by law the trusts are created and can only be held to the benefit of, group of the people who occupy it. Governance is by trustees. And then you'll, you'll note that the auditor and the attorney are direct reports to the trustees because basically they are the independent uh, check on whoever's running the trust and whoever's uh, all these other vendors who are in there. So the our firm is the administrator uh, and wellness consultant, and then all of the other parts that go into the claims payment reinsurance, uh, the actuaries, basically all of the parts. On the rates, these are the active rates, and it's a, there's a lot of data in here, but I'll start at the top. Uh, if you look, it says active employees, EO is employee only, ES is employee spouse, EC1 is employee plus one child, EC plus is multiple children, employee multiple children, and EF is employee spouse and one or more, more children. So what we're showing at the top is the current gold plan rates for the district. <coughs> versus uh, the trust and AET's current EPO rates. That's the closest match between them. Then we have next year's rates for um, the trust, for, I'm sorry, for Lake Havasu School District's trust, which is a 2021 gold plan again. Then we have the current high deductible health plan for the district, the current uh, NAET's current rates, and then the 2021 rates for high deductible health plan. There's an asterisk on NABT because they're meeting, I believe, in two weeks to do their renewal. They're expecting a, they have somewhere between a, a 0.4 and a 4% uh, renewal. We're expecting it to come in at about 2.5% when everything is said and done. So if you're looking at the bottom, oops, not good. If you look at the bottom of the, um, the two, those are the current closest compat comparators. Uh, for the active rate, so if you look at the employee only, you'll see a difference of about $130 a month for the, for the uh, uh, school district houses being higher, a little bit closer, about uh, $115 on the employee spouse, $200 on the child, single child, uh, $225 on the plus children, and then about uh, $305 for the employee family. So those will, the bottom numbers will go up again 
two and a half percent ballpark in the next couple of weeks. Okay, these are the retiree rates, and these are the ones that have a fairly dramatic difference. Um, and just to cut to the chase on the bottom with the asterisk of the two and a half percent. So the, the current rates uh, for NAET or the rates that, that um, Havasu schools would have minus about two and a half percent are substantially higher all the way across the board, particularly on the family side. And the reason for this difference is that this, today the Havasu schools does what's called a composite rate. So, <clears throat> so essentially what's happening is the retiree rates are being blended with the employee rates. What that does is brings the employee rates up by some percentage to offset the cost for retirees. The offer of membership with NAEDT is contingent on those being broken out to be a separate self-supporting retiree rate. Now for Lake Havasu schools today, the current unfunded liability on retiree rates is about nine and a half million dollars based on the most recent actuarial study. So what this would do is the district would, if it did this, this would be the most dramatic impact, and, and the district would have to decide how to accommodate this financially. Um, uh, and that's, that's frankly, that's, that's, that would probably be the toughest question I would think in this entire discussion. Uh, we know there's a, there's a percentage now that are currently on there, I believe if recollection serves me, there's 102 more in the current workforce who are eligible, ballpark figures, but about 100 employees who have had in a closed class of potential eligibles are still working, but who would someday be eligible for the retiree benefit. Madam President, do you have a question? No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, dental and vision is composite rates. Frankly, there's not a lot of money in the dental rates, so you can leave those composite. And again, you just see that they tend to be um, pretty favorable. Vision's been a, been a problem for the school district. Um, just because of provider issues that we've dealt with over the last couple of years. This one's pretty straightforward. Okay, this is terrible. Um, I have additional copies here, but I've got, if anyone wants them, I gave the board members copies. When you look overall, the benefits for uh, any of are considerably richer uh, in terms of out-of-pocket maxes, in terms of deductibles, uh, than what's currently in force. And I can, I'd be happy to walk through that page by page if you would like. Uh, and again, basically you're just reflecting the fact that the uh, square risk has a magic all its own in terms of what you're able to finance and afford and keep stable over time. I do have a question now. Um, I'm looking at the non-embedded versus embedded, and I was here for part of the meeting where that was explained, but I want to make sure that I understand it. So if it's non-embedded, that means the employee reaches that deductible maximum, but then any other family members, um, it's easier to talk about specific numbers. If the, if the non-embedded amount is $2,000 um, with a maximum deductible of $3,000, the employee who's covered can go up to that $2,000, but if they have a family member who also accrues $1,000 worth of expenses, that counts towards their deductible. Am I understanding that? <coughs> no, I, yeah. I don't think so. Let me make okay. it, that one always is confusing. It's a term of art to come out of the, the health care reform. Uh, and it, uh, a non-embedded deductible means that whatever that out-of-pocket max is or the plan your deductible, so in this case you're looking and it just says on the high deductible it says 2700 for a family. Mm -hmm. The combination of family, employee, spouse, and or children uh, would have to get to 2700 before the plan would begin to pay. So on the current plan, it gets an embedded deductible, right? On the current plan, uh, it's four thousand dollars. It'll be a comparable figure. Okay. Out of pocket maximum. That's the deductible, and then the out of pocket max it works the same way, uh, but it's it's six thousand for a family versus eight thousand on the current plan. So on the out of pocket max here, a single individual would actually do better on the current plan. On the high deductible because it would start paying at four thousand out of pocket max for them versus six thousand on the NADT plan. They make out better on the deductible. They get they have higher liability on the out of pocket max on the high deductible. Okay. Uh, Madam President, I have a question. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the Havasu school rates right now, and I know that they're not embedded, but I just there's a reason why health insurance is everybody's favorite topic. I do have one question. Yeah. Um, 
You had mentioned the retirees um, have to be rated separately. Um, and I recall that being part of, I don't know if it was the CAFR or the GASPI or that that is in fact what we were doing wrong before, so to speak, that we weren't rating it differently. And was I misunderstanding it then or now? It's not a right or wrong, it's how you do it financially because what's happening today is that on the employee, because it's a composite rate, the district is actually paying more on the employee side. But because the district doesn't subsidize, I believe, on the dependent side, actually the active employees are buying down the rate for the retirees. So by brief, you, and that's where that $9 million liability comes from. It's, it's what's the current value of the future benefits for the ones who are currently on the plan and that 100 give or take that are coming. Okay? And the district then has to recognize that liability on its capper because it's unfunded. So it does ultimately come back to bond ratings and things like that. Okay. As, and similar, it's treated the same way as, as sick leave, any kind of paid leave. If there's a dollar value to that leave and it tends to escalate over time as employees promote, it raises their base rates go up. So you have to continually adjust upward the dollar value of that liability. Maybe I'm thinking different. I mean, maybe I'm thinking of something else. Then was it that we had to put the money separately? Correct. Okay. That yeah, the that's only way you can knock down that liability, right, <clears throat> is to actually have it funded and essentially in a lockbox account. So you can't just say, well, we've got to, we set up this, this account over in XYZ in our books and we put $3 million or whatever in there. It literally has to be unreachable for the government for it to actually get, to decrease that $9 million. And that liability, um, is it legal to, like in this particular instance, it looks great for our employees, but it doesn't look good for our retirees. Are you able to buy that out? Like, buy your retirees out, like give them the money that they would need, but then they would buy their plan elsewhere besides with this trust? I don't want the answer to that. And, but I can t the only thing I can tell you from dealing with my county clients, and I didn't have to do with retirees, but they were attempting to do some buyouts to buy some senior folks out. Um, and beyond any other legal issues, it impacted um, the Arizona State Retirement System. Okay because of the long-term liabilities there. So they had to pre-fund some additional liabilities on that side. So okay. I, would, I, would, I would say if I can't answer okay. that, that's so I, would, I would check with council on that. How much is our district going to save by entering the NAEBT? Um, mm -hmm. Madam Chair, Member Cox, I haven't run that number. Okay. Uh, I think Mike Mary will eventually run okay. that if you start to get into that range. Uh, but if you look, I mean, if you run the numbers back here, um, so we go back on the, on the active rates. So you've got about 400 employees, ballpark, right? So it would be $130 a month times the number of employees times 12 is the immediate dollar change. Right? And, and you run that all the way across. Is the retiree plan as presented here, is it set in stone? The, the retiree <coughs> benefits are identical. So the plan does not distinguish, so that it's, they have the choice between the EPO or the high deductible health plan. The, the district has, has a, a gold plan and a silver plan for retirees, they don't. So they all get the same plan, so it's strictly a matter of how the premiums work out to cover the costs. Okay, so then, then the, the next step is how are those premiums paid? Right, does the district continue to pay at some level? How do you share the cost with retirees? That, that's the whole question that comes into play. So we do have a discussion there. So potential uh, choices there. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned that Mayo was not, unless you had certain outliers uh, covered. What goes in its place? The, basically with Mayo, well, the, Mayo is still in, but it's, a, it's limited to transplants. So there's a specific number of solid organ transplants they're doing, and um, uh, emergency admits per healthcare reform. So basically the other facilities in the Phoenix area that would provide those services outside of Mayo. Uh, there is an out in the plan, frankly rarely used, but I've seen it come into play, where um, th there's a particular specialty, and, there, and Mayo in fact does have the only ones in that particular area. So when that occurs on the, on the recommendation of the case management firm, so they've gone out and checked and said, nope, we does this for Mayo, then Mayo is, is done on uh, in that work. One of the emails I got from an employee uh, in advance of this meeting was asking the question, 
of uh, out of state. Uh, it's something that I run into in the, in the private insurance market. When I sent my son to an out of state college, I had to get a different plan for him because my plan didn't work out of state. How is that handled in this plan? This one actually has the entire Blue Cross Nationwide network. So if any state they're in, they get access to the Blue Cross network in that state. So where we typically see that is non custodial children. Um, uh, church missions, church missionaries who are who are in the in the United States, um, and then uh, university or college students across the state. And then, if I'm reading this correctly, the um, uh, I've got the second page under the Northern Northwest Arizona EBT retiree uh, plan comparison. Um, we're looking at this on a retiree only, with no spouse or children. Uh, we're looking at $2,086.95 as being the delta, or roughly $180 a month. Yeah, I think that's... Is that something you prepared, Mike? Or? Correct. Yeah, this is this is a discussion piece. Yeah. So currently, uh, the district funds $4,000 for, for retirees. Uh, they make a $4,000 contribution. This plan that you see in front of you is the discussion piece. Okay. I'm, I'm jumping ahead. Sorry. Okay. The, the blue card that you talked about, or that was talked about in the meetings, um, you can use that at teaching colleges all over the country. Okay. Uh, teaching colleges like UCLA or um, other any cutting edge any you know, doctor, medical facility. Any medical provider, if they're contracted with Blue Cross in the state in which that person is receiving care, they get the Blue Cross rates. So you may give up Mayo, but you gain everything else around the country. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for the retirees, when they reach uh, Medicare, coverage, <coughs> do they go on Medicare or do they stay on this or is there a combination? That's a good question. No, they go on Medicare. They automatically come off on Medicare eligible. So then they would go from Medicare to Medicare supplement. So do we know how many retirees from, a, from an age standpoint would be Coming up to that, we I have not run that number. Out. We've got those numbers. We have okay. that here for so, some discussion. Basically. Okay, all right. Or do we want to write out? No, we don't have to. I just thought he wanted to get through his presentation. No, I'm fine. I'll stop. Basically, I'll sit here and answer questions as long as you guys need to. And I'll happily give you the mic too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Mike, I don't have that number. You want to keep that one then? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's we got the benefit comparison. So. The offer of membership would be effective. It was extended at the January 28th meeting. The requirements are that from the from NABT, because by the way, none of them have retirees. They all got out of the retiree benefit thing many moons ago. So for them, it's a different issue. Uh, so you have to. The conditions are you have to have that separate rate structure, or you finance it. You have to have that separate rate structure in order to come into the trust. Uh, and then the rate differential, because what they've done is they they are all on a common rate structure, but the districts. I'm trying to remember the exact percentage, but I think north of 20 percent of the districts average claims costs are somewhere north of 20 percent of theirs. So they were not kind enough to let to increase their rates to absorb Patterson School. So they basically did is said, we'll put you on a separate rate structure. But then they'll lock it. So whatever that percentage is, where it's different, now wherever it is, it will stay flat for three years. We'll lock in, and then they'll reevaluate at the end of three years to see if the rates have have um, that gap, that delta has closed. Okay. So, and so at the end of the three-year period, we might be eligible to be sort of combined with the other rate. Right. Is that okay? And the way let me, let me go into that, uh, Madam mm -hmm. President, I think it's really important because what happens is. You in and, and their rates are going to be done in the, in the next two weeks. Okay, so we always get the rating done in February. So there is no promise high or low on how Lake Havasu Schools rates are done. The, what the offer is is saying, hey, look, just when we do all of our rates, we'll tell you where you guys wind up. If it's high and you want to leave, you'll leave with no penalty. If, it, if the Delta has closed, then they'll, they'll close the gap. Okay? Um, and I'll go through this because I can walk through some other issues on how it all works in terms of the schools. Um, so the employer has to contribute for active employees 80 percent of the employee only coverage and 25 percent of the dependent. Those are minimums. You're welcome to do higher, but they're minimums. And I will tell you where that comes from because I was actually involved heavily in putting together the trust for NAEDT back in 2012. 
is that what we have found in school, the schools or academic institutions are uh, particularly involved because they don't tend, they tend not to subsidize the dependent coverage at all as a group. And the problem you have with that is that when you don't subsidize the dependent coverage, the only people who buy it are those who can't afford not to have it. So you get adverse selection and the claims just tend to spot. So they put the 25% minimum in to make sure that it was cheaper to get it through the trust than it was to buy on the open market so that the younger people in particular would stay on the plan. Uh, as somebody who has paid a lot of uh, physicians medical school bills with my payments over the years, um, young tends to be healthy. The more, the more young folks you get, the more kids you get in the plan, the more stable rates, and that's exactly where this came from. Okay. Uh, you have to take all the benefits, the medical, the RX, dental, vision, life, EAP, and wellness. The one exception on this is um, what, they're, what they're looking at now. The district has a much different life insurance benefit. And Stephanie, who runs this trust, has, is speaking with them to let the district basically keep, because we'll leave the life insurance alone for the first year and look at rolling that in the second year. There's some issues with taxation with the way the district is currently doing it. There's an uh, imputed income calculation that has to be done. Uh, so we're going to talk about whether how that's being done today and we're going to roll in uh, the district on year two on the life insurance. Can I just make sure I heard the first part? So life insurance will remain untouched for this first year? <coughs> Asterisk. Currently, they have to make a decision on that, but that's the record, the staff recognition. Okay. So pluses and minuses. Um, again, the rate stability. Basically, if you spread the risk over a greater population, it doesn't mean you don't have bad years. I, I just did a renewal last year with a group that's had less than 3% average increases since 2002 that clobbered this year on claims. They had a 10% increase. Okay. Uh, but a greater risk spread tends to be uh, greater predictability. It is this NABT was put together specifically to um, to recognize some of the things that were going on here. One of them, frankly, was just I call it sheep stealing between the three cities. Um, at, before they did this, they all had their own self-funded plans. Um, Bullhead City, for example, had a, had a bounty on police officers. Uh, if you went to the, to the academy and graduated from any other agency in the state, they paid $9,000 to on graduation to go work for them. Right? So basically, the city managers had to sit down and say, okay, we're going to quit stealing from each other. So the three cities have exactly the same benefit plan. So if people are looking between the three cities, the only difference is how much they subsidize, what portion of the premiums they pay. So it's a way to quit rating each other. Um, the other thing is, because we are in northwest Arizona, <coughs> dire emergencies, the car wrecks, the heart attacks, that type of thing, tend to be helicoptered to Vegas versus Phoenix. And by putting in the blue card, what it gave them the ability to do that that this district currently doesn't have is we got the Blue Cross discounts um, up in the Vegas and in the Nevada market, and I will tell you it was dramatic. Uh, the reduction was more than 20% in claims in the first year just on those on those emergency backs up in the Vegas. Um, emphasis on wellness is huge with uh, mobile on psychomography, which this district does, but also going into cardiac, uh, skin cancer, diabetes, uh, for, for chronic disease state management, no buy-in, and then an opportunity to share in surpluses. The downsides. The one that's toughest to quantify is the need for consensus. Right now, you do whatever you want. The reality is your district owns your trust. Whatever you want to pay for it, you can do it. Okay. Here, there would be the fourth voice at a table. So it's basically you have to be able to sit in a group with your peers up in this area and cut the deal. Who can afford what? How much do you want to do? How, what, what benefits do you want to offer? Who's going to do what subsidies? You have to be able to do that at a table. And I will tell you in all candor, not every organization can do it. Uh, we, in, in one of the programs I run, uh, a multi-employer trust that operates in rural Arizona for the first time in the history of my firm, which is almost 28 years, and the first time in the history of that organization, which is uh, 18 years, they voted to nominate a member. And it was based on a lack of participation, lack of being at the table, being engaged. Uh, first time I've ever seen that in my career. So I, I can't emphasize to you enough, this is the software, <coughs> but it's that ability to sit at the table, rationally speak with your colleagues, you know, avoid the pontification, and come to the deal that's, that's sustainable over time. Uh, and then the exposure of deficits. So on one hand, you get surpluses and everything's good. 
you go ahead, just as in your current trust, you're, you apply a portion of the deficit. Both surpluses and deficits are a portion, excuse me, I blew a disc the other day. My knees are buckling right now. Um, <coughs> both surpluses and deficits are a portion pro rata. A portion? Pro rata. A okay. portion pro rata. So your disc would be probably about 28%. So any surpluses or deficits are done strictly based on how much you put into the trust. I say that because what they've done is these are community rates. They are they're not individual rate. Each district. Everything goes with the pool and you're rated in one entity. And that's the holding wall, this kind of thing. Okay. Okay, so if you decide to move forward, then by the governing board, you would have to approve the resolution. Uh, and the timing, the reason it says the timing is critical is because, especially in this district's case, because you have, you have an existing trust, there's a process of winding up that trust and getting it off the books. It takes about 18 months to do. Uh, there will be money left over in that trust, somewhere in the vicinity of $3 million uh, once the run out is done. So there might, there's a statute governing where that money, what that money can and cannot be used for. The, the board will have to decide all of that. And then there's uh, a process of onboarding, bringing your employees across. There's a switch in the third party claims administrator from Gills Bar to American, uh, getting information out, and doing open enrollment, and all of that. Um, so it is from your side, without putting pressure on, that there's a practical need for you to decide yay or nay. And frankly, if you say no, they're not going to cry. It's not going to create any kind of problems between Hazard schools and any of them. Uh, but for your employees to make that change and then on the other side to wind up the business of the existing trust, there's just quite a bit that goes into doing that in a legally compliant and financially responsible way. May I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. If we were to decide to, to approve this tonight, this, are we also approving the retiree um, chart or is that something open? Just a point of clarification, we can't vote to approve it tonight because this is a work session. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there you go. But let's say we're not a work session. Mm -hmm. Would it be set in stone, the retiree program would be set in stone with that vote, or we could we could deal with that? No, it's all in. The rates for the retirees are, would be set in stone. How you fund them is up to the district. Okay, right. so we can decide that later. Correct. Right. That, that whole thing goes with you from the district. <laughs> Up to you. Can I can I rephrase uh, Vice President Cox's question? Is there a way that we could separate retirees from the balance of of our uh, current pool? Uh, super, um, remember, that's that's what I was getting at with Nicole before. So I, I legally I don't know. Okay, I mean there, I know that the Arizona State Retirement System offers a plan. Uh, I don't know what the district's legal obligations are based on what was represented to employees. That, that one starts with returns. You know, what can you legally do, and then you get into the financial aid and all of that. But I just don't have the answer. I don't want to be incorrect information, so I apologize. So that would be one of our questions. Could we do that? Could we give our retirees money to contribute to the retirement system and do what they're going to do? I'm not sure. I know I'm not. Either. I know you're not, but I appreciate that. That was a lot of information that I'm be happy. I'll sit here all night and answer questions. One of my media doesn't give out. I follow the board, don't call 911, I'll get up. I'll be fine. I think we'd be happy to give you a chair if you would like one. Okay. But There's a stool uh, right back there in that next room. I, I'm not sure I could stand up again. Oh, no. <laughs> I just saw it. I was like, oh, no. It's on the right side. Put your knees yeah, a tall stool. stool. It's a tall stool. Oh, thank you. That is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> now you can stand up. Now I can get that. Hopefully your benefits cover. That would be sweet revenge for people. <laughs> well, if you don't mind, I mean, because this is a work session, I was hoping that, first of all, our board members would be able to ask their questions, but also um, people from the community, and especially people who are impacted by policy changes, might have a chance to ask you questions if they have any. So, is that okay with the board members? Would you like to ask your questions first and then we move to the public? Or how would you like to start? I would just like to be really clear that if there are retiree questions about what we're possibly going to do, those won't be directed to Mr. Collins. Mm -hmm. They would be directed to the board or to the administrators. And so they will have time later on this evening. Sure. But that won't, you're right, that won't be directed towards Mr. Collins. 
I do have a question. Well, it wasn't, it's not about the retiree stuff. It was going through quick. You said something about the retirees for the others. Are we the only ones that have a retiree premium? Were you saying that the other cities don't do anything with retirees? I don't know if I understood that correctly. Okay, thank you. So the, the three cities do not have retiree benefits outside of COBRA. Right. Okay, so basically when somebody retires, they get 18 months of COBRA, whatever the applicable number of hours, and then it runs out at some period of time. I thought that's kind of what you said, but I, w I was just curious if what the others did, so now I know. I, I, I'd like to counter that. My husband's retired for the city. I know there's a certain year that that benefit wasn't there, but it's very similar to the district as far as the year and my husband does get retirement benefits to the city through their trust. Yeah, and that, they're a closed class that where they end it. So that there's not with, where it's different. I understand what you're saying thing with that. The district, you still have a currently have 102 100, 100, I think it's 100, 102 employees who are eligible for it. They have a closed group that they're running off. And so it'd be the same thing, however you get there would be, but you have a, a much larger pool. So my question is, um, I'm, I was going back through some of my paperwork and the end, end review that you did in August of 2018 talked about our evaluation liability in the Gatsby 45 at 11.3 million-ish, and now it's about nine and a half million. Um, is there a reason for that other than we now have an actual actuary? There, or, there is. So okay. the question is, what was the difference in the in evaluation? When we came in and first started to look through all of the data, I think what we found was in terrible shape. Um, I made an assumption that actually the number was going to be closer to 14 million, and that was based on the quality of the data we were seeing. In fact, the data that had been provided to the former actuary was incorrect. It was incorrect in the favor of the district. So whoever set the fields for the dates for eligibility of service had miscorrectly stated them, it overstated the number. So in that, when those in Mike's office actually found that error. Okay. So Mr. Murray's office found that we corrected it based on his revised dates, okay. provided the actuary, so instead of being 14 or 11, it dropped down to 9. Okay. And that number will fluctuate. Uh, should decrease it, as people retire off the plan going to Medicare. The wild card in there is the, is the rate of medical inflation. So we've seen medical cost inflation 14 to 18%. So that'll inflate the number. Currently it's 6 to 8. So it's just that right now things have tamed a bit. Any other questions from the board or from the public? And do, claim, do current claims affect that? Gatsby number at all on the funding liability? So if the trust has a terrible year on claims, does that affect it at all? You know, um, uh, Madam President Marshall, I don't really know off the cuff. Uh, and frankly, I know that we're, I looked at the numbers before, and the district had apparently a terrible year um, um, with the plan. And, 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 and frankly, I'd, at the risk of sounding glib, what's driving this year is, is why we all have insurance. There's basically eight very large claims um, out there um, that are that are just under 200,000 each on the average. And that's going to happen. And that, that's the reality. But also, what it reflects uh, outside of the gathering liability, what it reflects is that spread of risk. We're spreading those claims over f roughly 400 employees and how many versus more. With those diagnoses would have been identical. They just would have been spread over a larger I was able to attend part of the EET work session um, last week, but not the entire thing. I do remember them talking quite a bit about, and I can't remember the lady's name who presented it. Jamie? Jamie. Stephanie. Okay, maybe, I think it was. Anyway, um, she talked quite a bit about the different scenarios that could come up and, and what it, the cost to a person would be right now versus what it would be under the NAEBT. Um, and I thought she mentioned a couple of specific drug pricing, the uh, drugs that would be priced different, differently. Do you recall that information? Or? I, I don't. I, okay. I think what I can tell you is there's two different. There's CDS Caremark is currently the, it's called PDM, the Prescription Method Manager, okay. right? And then um, on, the, on the NAEBT, it's an organization called NAVIS. They're two different. All of those companies run different formularies and have different deals to, to negotiate pricing for specific drugs. They, they vary. Okay. So I don't know what she presented. I apologize. Okay. 
And if you can look at that one comparison sheet that you have a copy of that Aaron put up there, it'll show you the rate for the, the co-pays on there of tier one, tier two, and then the specialty drug. I see, I see this. Is that what you're referring yeah, to? it's that one that's highlighted in yellow. One of the things that Jamie was talking about was um, there were some high cost drugs that um, there were some high cost drugs that our plan covered something like five of them and the other the other plan covered um, some of those five but um, anyone that was anytime there's specialty drugs involved they, they there's a period of time where they work with the providers and the people that are using those medications to work through the plans to make sure that they're, you know, using the right medications and whatnot and they have sort of a, a work through process on the drugs that they're taking to make sure that they have a, have a good plan. Yeah, speaking broadly, thank you, Marsha. I didn't look at this. Like, she was talking about that the, on the EPO plan, the, the max for, for a single specialty drug, so the overall per would be $150. Um, but on any ET, that's three hundred twenty-five dollars today. So that's the what you're talking about. Because mm -hmm. then people who are currently in their drugs, their costs would double. Actually, decrease by half. It goes down. I'm sorry, I thought you said one fifty under ET. Uh, one hundred fifty under ET, three hundred twenty-five under Lake House and Schools. Thank you. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Collins at this time? Not really for okay. The Mayo um, being eliminated except for the transplants and emergencies, what if you are currently on Mayo going through, say, cancer treatment or whatever? What happens to you <coughs> and that coverage come July 1st? Excellent question. So there are current treatment. I can't go into specifics because the district is small enough that I can't say a diagnosis. So with that exception. I can tell you that under Arizona law, for specific diagnoses such as cancer and pregnancy, uh, it is illegal to interfere with that until the current course of treatment has run. So there's a, those people essentially get grandfathered in to continue their course of treatment at Mayo, and then until that diagnosis is done. Thank you. Okay. Good question. Thank you for asking that. I think he might be out of the hot seat for the time. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's rose specifically for him, but this is a guesstimate on percentage to retire. He's going to go up. I haven't seen anything. I don't know what the number. I know what I'm paying now. So I'm just, uh, just trying to get a guess on as soon as <coughs> July 1st. That's that's part of the discussion. Yes. Yeah. We're, we're, we're doing a work session right now to, to try and ferret out which direction that's going to go. But I thought Karen said the rate it will will be set in stone is how we pay for it. Yes. Correct. Yes. So he's looking he's looking for his payroll number. Right. What what is what's going to come out of your check is what you're looking for. Wouldn't that be on this payment? That hasn't been determined yet. So there's yeah, that's just a work session document. Right yeah. yeah. Right. So they're talking about the rate increases, but our board could decide to increase the, the subsidies that we provide to cover the, their increase in costs. Okay, but we haven't gotten we haven't quite gotten there yet. If you don't mind holding off on just a little bit, okay. Any other questions for Mr. Collins? Okay. Then I think you might be out of the hot seat for the moment. I I do appreciate your willingness to answer all of our questions. In your knowledge. Madam President, thank you very much. Oh, like you. Appreciate this. I apologize. I did have a question. The retiree uh, insurance uh, different group, is that based on an age? <coughs> Say that again. Is the retiree separate group, is the is the calculations done on an age? It, um, that's a very good question. So the, the rate per se is, is a combination of how, how costs go up as we all age. So again, as I mentioned before, like for kids, you have the percentage of morbidity, the illness, and the associated claims go up is considerably lower. As all of us age, it goes up, so it's a, it's a factor of the utilization of medication and medicine as we age. Okay. Short answer is yes, yeah, a factor in there. At what age is that median? 
and no idea for retirees because they're, they're treated as a separate class. I think if, if I might, is your question, is retirement based on your age or employment status? Is that your question? Yeah, because I can be 50 and working and I'm going to be in one category and I'm going to be 50 and retired and my rates are going to go up because I'm now retired. I haven't changed my health, my age, anything else. Okay. So, yeah, so I know, well, if you look in there, now, and thank you, I understand, if you look in there, what he actually uses is the Arizona State Retirement System's morbidity and mortality tables to generate the numbers specific to Arizona. Her, I, think her, I think her question is actually framed up uh, based on what would be early retirement from, from the, uh, the outside world, uh, but our employees generally will retire, come in on what we would call pre L and then be re-employed in the district. So, and if I may, just because I have this here, in the GASPI 75, I think this is the 75, um, it talks about how it increases 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, these are ages, 45, so every time you hit that number, the it rate is changing. Goes into the calculation. Right. But if you're asking, like, so if you retired at 50, mm -hmm. would your rate be lower than a retiree who was 63? The answer no, it's a blended rate for the entire retiree. So again, if I were 50 and still working, my rates are lower because I'm 50 and retired. I just got you're in the retiree category, correct? Fishing. So you're in the retiree category. Okay. Yeah. That is correct. Thank you. I think we might be done for the moment okay. with this, at least with this part of the discussion. Okay, Madam President, thank you again for your time. If you have any questions, just call. Just thank you. Okay, thank you. And again, thank you for that stool. Do you have a copy of what they have? The benefit converter? So what we're hoping to come out of this work session is some discussion of um, the advantages and disadvantages as the board sees it for joining the North, Northwest Arizona Trust. We know that our employee benefit trust board has recommended that we do so. And uh, we do know and understand that there are some um, differences, particularly with the retiree benefit cost. And so Mr. Murray has put together some numbers. Uh, we'd like to talk about um, what the, the net impact would be for us of doing this and what uh, possibilities we can have for the subsidy of the retirement benefits. So I'm going to ask Mr. Murray to share some of the information that he's passed out. Before we get into numbers, can I say one thing or ask one thing? Um, and I have no idea what you're going to talk about in terms of how far back we're going to go, but I'm hoping that in this discussion that we can kill a few birds with one stone. Things that have been an issue since before our superintendent came here um, with the dependent care coverage, the, um, the subsidy of that that was made um, that really does pull from our teachers 301. You know, this is not an equitable distribution because we're subsidizing using 301 money and that has been an aching uh, ongoing issue. So at least if we can address it all in this conversation um, and then of course whatever I don't know if that's part of it but it should be because here we're going to be asked to subsidize again and I want to be clear that we weren't asked before we are subsidizing and it has caused us a huge headache so I would just like to address all those little issues that we've had to just kind of plug that hole but <coughs> we should talk about them openly and honestly That's it, sorry. Yeah. So, to go to, to Hal's question earlier, <clears throat> I think my view, 
re restate it just in case I missed the mark since it's been a little bit of time. But on my desk right here, I have uh, the number of retirees who will be uh, turning 65 uh, from now, basically this fiscal year, until the very last employee, uh, which would actually be two employees in the year 2048. So we would have currently, as we have written in policy, we would have an obligation to the year 2048 uh, when that very, those very last employees who were hired before July 1st, 2005 will actually then uh, reach the age of Medicare unless that changes, which would be a whole other discussion because we'd have to address policy uh, with that if Medicare actually increased the age. Uh, we have 100, about 105 uh, active employees who who um, make up that, uh, that those those uh, categories from fiscal year 2020. So at the end of this year, we'll have five employees who will uh, reach the age of um, Medicare. In the year 2021, we'll have five more. In the year 2022, we'll have 12 that fall off at that time, and so on and so on, until we get to 2048, where the final two will then be qualified for Medicare. Next year, we'll have approximately 38 retirees. That's those who have, uh, are currently retired or who have uh, notified the district they're in, that they're intending to retire. And the next year, we have roughly 38 uh, who are in that pool of retirees that the district would then, under the current policy, would subsidize at $4,000 towards their medical benefits. Currently, for this plan here, for the gold, the gold plan, the district pays $9,019.20. We contribute $4,000, as mentioned, plus there's another $1,800 that's given through Arizona State Retirement System benefit uh, for a total of about $3,200 that a retiree only would pay for their medical for the year. That's under the current. Plan. Then we get to the conversation that we were just presented here regarding uh, what happens if the district will either stay the course with LHSEBT or going to NAEBT. Uh, keeping our current EBT in place, uh, we have roughly, with a reduction in benefits, we were facing about a 15.5% increase and premium, but during the EBT meeting last last week, um, there, there was a motion made pending the decision of the board in the future that there would be a slight reduction in some of the benefits, which then lowered that uh, rate to about 10.5% increase instead of 15.5%. So there was a trade-off to that. There would be a lower um, lower increase to the tune of ten and a half percent, but then there's a trade off of a, of a reduction of reductions in benefits. Uh, not real drastic, but nevertheless there is a change. So under that that current uh, if we were to stay here with the same EBT, our employee only um, in, uh, insurance premium would go to nine thousand nine hundred twenty three dollars and twenty eight cents. Uh, for employee only uh, compared to $9,019 that we're at this year. Um, if we <clears throat> were to change to NAEBT, that premium, <coughs> that premium would be $9,396.36. If you're looking at the board, if you're looking at your, your two packets, you can see that pages five and six, there's some calculations. <coughs> so if we went to the NAEBT, we would have an increase of approximately just under $200,000 if we were to pay that uh, slight increase in joining the NAEBT. If we were to stay with our current EBT, the increase would be just under $500,000, be $480,000. Um, and just employee-only contributions to the district. So right there is 
you know, the $280,000 increase. Mike, yes. the, uh, <coughs> the comparison there, did you factor in that anticipated 2.5% increase at NAEBT? That's correct. Yeah, that does reflect the 2.5% proposed increase. Okay, thanks. So, let me, can I just address your 301 question then real quick? Because sure. it is similar, it is the same, but kind of a little different. 301 <coughs> currently um, offsets the cost to MNO for those employees who qualify for 301. So out of that $9,019.20, we take um, $425 uh, three times when those three disbursements occur. Uh, at a total of about $1,275. $1, so that acts as an offset to their $9,019 that the district contributes out of m &O. So what that basically does is it helps relieve m &O by roughly $1,200, $1,275. Uh, it's not going towards dependents or anything like that. It's strictly just to kind of relieve m &O because we're allowed to do that under Fund 13. <coughs> So I don't know where you'd like me to go with this as far as Well and I just want to go, I just want to be clear about why I'm addressing it because I know that fund thirteen or I know that we um, um, try to attract teachers, especially within the state, saying we give our employees all of their three oh one money. But in fact some of that three oh one money is going to subsidize employees that aren't eligible. Is that correct? No, that's not. It's we, not. The, that 1275 is only used for those 250 some odd teachers who actually receive 301. So in, in, in line item uh, on our big spreadsheet, if it's, if, it, if it's a 301 paid teacher, I have the $9,100 dollar amount there minus the twelve seventy five which then shows how much we're really contributing out of M O to that employee. So it's it's strictly for that it's for that, that class of employees, those who receive three oh one benefits. Then how are we paying that for the rest of everybody else? We're not I mean they don't pay a premium if they're only an employee. The district contributes the full nine thousand and then half. So all that's doing is really just softening M and L. The amount that's being paid out of M and L. Okay. Uh, it's allowing us to use a different fund and help to soften the blow to our maintenance on operations general fund. By statute, it allows us to do that. Now so we, we could we could um, take that twelve seventy five, keep it in fund thirteen fully pay 100%, but then that, that 1275 times the 250 odd number of employees would then come out of maintenance and operations. All right, I understand that better. But so the least of our employees get the biggest benefit then, because if you're a 301 staff member and you're having part of your 301 soften the blow to m &L, those that come in with the increased minimum wage are actually getting the better benefit for our MO dollars. They they could, yeah, because then there's more monies there to increase salaries. Because we're paying hundred percent for each employee. Right. But we're using 301 to pay for the teachers and the staff members eligible, and then we're just taking out no money and paying for everybody else. Right. I just want to make that clear because there that has been an you know an underlying issue. And, and I don't want to make that mistake as we go forward with the retirees and just not be really clear about what we're doing, what it's going to cost. So just talking about that. Sorry. Mr. Murray? I have a question. Yes. Um, you had talked about um, our increase next year at 10.5% would, would be a decrease in benefits. And then you compared it to us joining the city. But if we join the city, there is no loss of benefits. Is that correct? Well, as, as Aaron mentions, Mr. Collins mentioned, there's 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 a lot of alignment, a lot of apples to apples comparison. There are some some differences. For for example, the um, uh, the cancer center, um, 
Mayo, Mayo Clinic down in, in Phoenix. Um, but most most benefits line up pretty well. And then there is the addition of the blue card that you mentioned that, that is really a nice nice benefit of the program. Uh, and what that does is it allows, if you don't have a doctor in the area here, and you have someone that you've established uh, in the Blues Network in a different state, California or a neighboring state, you can, then, you can then travel to that particular doctor and see them as your in-network doctor, whereas in our current plan, you can't do that. It would be an out-of-network experience. <coughs> May I ask what benefits we're looking at losing? If we stay with the EBT? Yes. I don't have that comprehensive list in front of me. Most of it was, and, and Mrs. Cox is here too from, the employee benefit trust. Uh, there, there was some great, uh, there were some benefit inc uh, deductible increases. So slight increases, I believe, to the individual and family uh, deductible from like 750 to uh, I don't remember 800 or 900, um, and then the <coughs> offset was the 2,000 for the family versus 1,500, something along that line. We'll get that published. Um, so that you, everyone has that side-by-side -side comparison. All of this just came to be within the last several days, so we're, we're scrambling just to get rates under control because I know that's, that's a major thing right now that, that everyone's concerned about. Um, but from what I saw, and then I'm looking at this sheet here, um, there, are, there are mostly similarities. So I don't, I don't see it as being a negative by any means of, of going to that that particular EDT. Okay. Okay. I think the biggest difference was the, the co-pays of the drugs between the AADT and the changes that we had to make in the, the EDT plan. And then, because um, the NADT was at 800, and I think we changed our, ours to 800 for the deductible. There, there weren't a lot of, there weren't any real significant yeah. increases. So we increased the emergency room <clears throat> co-pay yeah, the doctor's okay. I think the, the, your physician's okay went up $5. Yeah, I think it was that card. Yeah. So 25 to 30 or something like yeah. that. So minimal increases, but there's still a decrease in benefits. So that's not what we want to have. Did you have anything further for your presentation? Or? Well, I, I have proposals for numbers if that's what you want to hear from me or if you want to pull it out of it. So again, like I mentioned, uh, for fiscal year, this, this current fiscal year, retirees, uh, for a retiree only would pay roughly $3,200. And that's a, a fixed contribution rate of 4000 and that's in policy. So anything that the board decides to do would have to revisit policy change that paragraph that is very specific to that contribution rate and then um, update that with whatever's decided upon. Um, no matter what we do, there's, there's an increase to it. So I'm just going to paint the picture here on my calcu calculation sheet. With a 10.5% roughly um, increase to our employee rates. Like I mentioned, we're looking at $480,000 increase compared to this current fiscal year. Uh, that would have about $137,000 um, increase reflection into our uh, current dependent care or dependent subsidies. So that would have another $137,000 increase to that. Mostly because of rates, but also because we do have um, increased participation. We have about six more employees who have who have elected to cover their uh, one child, about 11 more who have elected to cover children, and then our employee spouse and employee families remain the same from last year to this year. Um, so we're just kind of going off the current numbers that we have to offer those projections going into next year. So obviously that can fluctuate depending on uh, who elects to cover uh, who in their family. So the projected retiree subsidy, if we were to stay with the, the current EBT, we offer, like I mentioned, $4,000. If we increase that to $5,000, 
that would give us roughly, that would create about a $62,000 increase in doing that. So all of those combined, we're looking at roughly $680,000 in increase to uh, our medical plan, uh, our, med our medical contributions when it comes to staying with the current EBT. <clears throat> if we look at switching to the NAEBT, again, the and projected employee rate is, is only about uh, just $370 more uh, per year compared to almost $1,000 more. So that increase would be just under $200,000. The dependent care subsidy would be around $84,000. Now this is where we get a little creative here because the rates are, as you saw, are so much higher. So this is the, the point of discussion. Um, if, if we change that $4,000 number in policy to a percentage, that might be more lasting as far as not having to come back and revisit this year after year after year. Uh, for that specific dollar amount of four thousand dollars or five thousand dollars whatever it may be uh, if we change that to a percentage <clears throat> that would mean that there would be a shared cost for the district and the employee over year after year after year so the district would as premiums increase the district would naturally pay more and then there would be a shared cost to the employee or to the retiree as well so in throwing that percentage into the formula, if we propose a 75% um, coverage for the employee, So if we factor in 70% increase in, in district subsidy, or 70% district subsidy, if we have $13,200.12, which is the NAEBT retiree only premium, medical premium, just strictly medical and RX, we took 70% of that figure that would give us $9,240 for uh, the district's uh, employer contribution. Then if we take $1,800 off of that for the ASRS retirement uh, contribution, the ASRS contribution, that would bring us to about $2,100, $2,160. Uh, so, and that would be that the retiree would we cover 100% of dental and vision, so it would just be 70% of the medical and RX line. And like I mentioned, that would calculate out to be roughly roughly $2,160.12. $2 Based on the current proposed rates, uh, obviously the NAEBT will be meeting uh, next week <laughs> to finalize these numbers. But that is much different than what we what we saw before if we just factored in the regular four thousand dollar contribution that we've been doing for a number of years. 
So if we change that, like I said, in policy to reflect a percentage versus a dollar amount, uh, that's just that's one one option. So if we did that, um, going back to that calculation sheet, our increase is about a half a million dollars um, versus the the six hundred eighty thousand dollars if we stay the course with the LHSEBT. So when you factor in that increased subsidy for retirees, the dependent care, the increased cost that the district's going to have also with our employees, and that premium increasing, we're looking at, at roughly a $180,000 difference between staying where we are today and transition or transitioning over to NAEBT. And along with that, that retiree premium will be less than if we stayed with the LHSEBT. So, who's happy to be talking about this right now? <laughs> Y'all are smiling out there. Yeah, we're talking about it. We're talking about it. <laughs> well, we shouldn't be talking about it because that was a benefit that was promised us years ago by people sitting right up there. You said there's no money for raises for you. For all those years, you said there's no money for raises, but you got to contribute to the district. So, so we did. And now you're taking money away from us again. So, so you should let me, contribute hundred percent. You let have me, the money. Didn't you have a four point eight million dollar carryover? So, so I, I understand where you're at. I do. Right now, you're enjoying four thousand dollars, and what we just proposed was north of nine. That's better. Okay. But it should be hundred percent because that's what we were promised. I was promised I could keep my doctor. Oh, my job. Job. Yeah. 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 No, part of our salary as a teacher, that was part of our benefit. It was, and, we, and you do have it in writing that has been provided for me, and um, this was promised, I understand that this was not promised by any of us as right, individuals, no. but, but this was promised, there. you're right, this was promised by people who represented the entity that we now represent, right. and I do take it as a matter of maybe not character is the right word, but I'm sitting here and I have absorbed the promises that other people have made that I now represent. And whether or not I would have made those same promises is immaterial. I am obligated by what is in the contract and what is promised to you. That's my stand on it. So I think it's really unrealistic to expect this board to go back to 100%. Um, see what? Well, I'm going to tell you why, if you'll allow me to speak. Um, first of all, that was promised long before 2005, at which point the policy was changed, and the additional people were grandfathered in. Well, the board policy says that it was changed in 2005. The end, but the no, no paying was up to 2015. I just don't understand how you can take a contract that, that was signed by LHUSD and revise those terms. I, I don't understand how you can I guess I don't have a copy of that, so. It was, sorry. I believe it was provided to you. I believe the employee, we received an email, and I believe she emailed every single member of the board. And well, it has this as an attachment. It did have this as an attachment. Well, then I will go back and double check because I did read the email. Okay. Um, but we've dumped a lot of money into, we've been held accountable for all the mistakes that the prior administration made. Um, and we have dumped millions of dollars in order to keep the benefits <coughs> floating for all the employees. And so the idea that I'm somehow responsible for promises somebody made long before insurance was an issue, um, you know, I've, I don't know if anybody has read through the minutes, I brought a copy here, but when you go back to 1985, you know, it wasn't the same world that we're living in now. And so there has to be a little bit of realistic uh, reality checking for the situation that we're in now. Um, and, and maybe working with the board to provide suggestions other than 
you feel entitled to 100% compensation because somebody 30 years ago promised it. That's not realistic. The world doesn't work like that. And I think that we need to talk about what we can do. That does not seem to be one of them. That's that's just not possible. Well, we have possible because you have the money. We have money, but why is all of the money that the district why has? Why don't you spend the money you have on the schools? You know, oh, I'm know? sorry. I don't know who you are. Could you provide your name? I'm a retiree. My name is Doug Holmes. Okay, Doug. Okay. I've never met you before, and I, I have never know. seen you here before. Oh, I've been around. Okay. I've been around for years. Doug Holmes. Okay. So, so let's, let's, let's bring it down so, a little bit. So, I'm not a child. I'm not going to be told to bring it down. This is a I, very I emotional a conversation for a lot of people, and you're not mommy. That was disrespectful. Uh, yes. No, your part was disrespectful. Yes. Let's let's move on. That's John, did you have something? I'm sorry, Mr. Madison, did you have something you want I, to say? I would also say that we get one pool of money. We're portioned by the state <coughs> the money that we get. And, and, and you're absolutely right. We, we've had extra money, and we've been dealing with debt with some of that money. In fact, in fact, the solar project, we paid that off with, with part of that. Part of that money is so that we have a carry forward so that we can open and run schools because the state isn't always punctual with the money coming forward. Neither are the taxpayers. Literally 10% of our budget every year is not coming to us because people don't pay their property taxes in a timely manner. We don't get money until people write the check to the county. That's literally how it works. So you have to have carry forward. You have to have a cushion so that you can open and operate the district every year. If we didn't have that, we would be in big trouble. So, so yes, we do have money, but that money is committed year over year in a, in a turnover as an operating budget for the district to start up and operate. What I would point out is, is literally because it's one pot of money, when we say we're spending more on benefits, even if it's a half a million dollars in this case, that money comes out of those operating funds. That comes out of money that could be put into everyone's payroll. Like when, we, one, two, three. When, when we start talking about $248,000 that we're talking about adding for retiree benefits, that's literally a thousand dollars for for pretty much every certified position in the in the, in the district. That's a thousand dollars that can't be put into building maintenance. That's a thousand dollars per employee that can't be put into a paycheck. It goes into benefits, but you know we're looking at how do we prioritize the spending, and how do we make something that will over time be a substantive change for the district and the operating costs and give us the opportunity to do some smart things down the road. How do we do that and then also work to make a better stab at honoring our commitment to our employees? We don't want to excuse what happened in the past. We want to honor it. But we also have to have a realistic thought process in how do we honor that? How do we unwind the problems that this EBT has had in recent memory? Realize that we're talking about two and a half percent increase when we look at the look at the Northern Arizona EBT numbers. We took a 24 percent and then a 10 percent, and then we were presented with a 15.5 that we think we can cut your benefits, take things away from you to get that number down to 10. We're working to not only preserve but expand everyone's benefits with this. And we're willing to say, you know what, we'll get within $100,000 of where we would have been anyway, because we're looking at the future. How do we plan this? How do we get these costs under control so that we're not, over the point of three years, going at 30 plus percent? That's untenable. If your cost of housing went at 30 plus percent, you'd have pitchforks out there in three years. So here we are. We as a district are looking at this in a much different way, and we're looking at how do we make this transition? How do we deal with the retiree pool that's going to be treated as a closed group by that transition? But then again, knowing that for the next three years, the retiree pool is not going to take an increase. And then how do we look at the rest of our district staff and say, how do we get your benefits up 
Because I put a kid in, in college this past year. In fact, Mr. Holmes, you were his PE teacher. James went to Illinois. But to get James to Illinois, I had to go out and I had to buy a separate insurance policy for him because it didn't cover it. What we're doing for you tonight is we're taking that and we're saying, if you're in that position, it doesn't have to be a college kid, but if you're in that position at any point in your life, we're not just going to give you the Arizona Blue Cross Network. We're going to give you the entire United States, and there's also international benefits to that. So if you decide like, to travel, I like the idea of this new trust. So I, like I just don't like the idea that we all were promised raises, and we didn't get them, and we sacrificed for the district, and then we hear that the insurance is going to go up, and the retirees are going to go up. Now, I like the idea of the 70%. That made me feel better. I actually think it should be 75. I think it should be high. I still think 100%. I, I'd, love to get, I'd love to get you 100%. I'm not sure that we can do it, though. That's, that's the only thing. I don't know if that's why I mean, yeah, I'm coming down a little bit, but I think that since we didn't get those raises for all those years, mm -hmm. when the district had the money, and I still think the district could come up with the money now, I think that we deserve, the retirees deserve at least 75 or 80%. Now, 100, I can understand that. But, but that's what we were promised. Well, so I, I would feel that you guys should at least try to get to that. I, I, I think that I would split between 70 and 80% with you. And I, and I think somewhere in the middle there is I think will be what we could do and should do as a district. In my, my personal opinion, not endorsed or voted on by the board, but I, I think that we do owe the people that work for us something. I think that we should take care of you. Because not only did I not get paid, but it hurt my retirement. I don't know. I get paid less now as a retiree than I would have if I would have gotten those raises. I don't disagree with any of that. So that hurt me. Yeah. And to reference the, and I'm sorry, I don't have the email that I received from the employee in front of me, um, so I'm relying on memory. But um, to reference her email, she was said some of the same things that, that you were saying now that they were promised that they stick with the district. Right. Yes, we don't have the money for raises, but we will right. cover your, um, your benefits. Um, now she, this was her point of view, she um, didn't love the increases that have occurred over the past few years, but she could live with those smaller increases. What really concerned her was looking at the chart and seeing a jump of $1,000, or you know, she has dependents as well, so it would be even more in her case. Um, so that, those are the problems that I think our board needs to have a serious discussion about offsetting some of those costs because it does sound very unrealistic from her point of view. Well, and I just want to point out this board has been offsetting those costs for the six years that I've been here, yes. bending over backwards to offset those costs for everybody, with all due respect. Um, and then I also want to point out that public education, K-12, is just about the only darn industry that A, you can retire at 50, and B, be made all kinds of promises. This is not the reality of our times for most people. And I'm sorry that you were promised things 30 years ago that cannot be delivered on now because things have changed drastically. It wasn't 30 years ago. Just a few years ago. Five years ago. Yeah, five years ago. That's when they started increasing. It was not five years, five years ago, ago that, that retirees were promised 100%. 2015 was the first year that retirees just my thing, I like everything Mike's saying, and just the bottom line is, I don't want to pay out, I just don't know which way it's going or how much. I understand that, but still, back to, we have been sitting here, we have been, and, and this district went a long time without any premium increases at all, and so that was promises that whoever made you in order to compensate you, but the fact is, is that people have been employed with this district for a long time, while I respect the fact that you've stuck here, um, it's a wonderful place to be. And if everybody really loves to have kids, I think that it's, um, I think it's disingenuous to act as though you're digging ditches and you're owed something. You've been employed for a long time here. Oh I don't know why that doesn't matter to anybody because I know a lot of people whose lives were devastated because they lost their jobs. And somehow that doesn't apply to K-12 employees. And, 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 and I would also like to point out that you had people sitting on your, you had employees sitting on your benefit trust board that were trying to figure out how to fire people in order to keep the trust running. Fire people. Written in your minutes. How many minutes. was the football stadium over budget when you were on the board? 
<laughs> well, let me tell you what that is, because we were given bad information. And then it's your responsibility to find that. And You're on we the board. Did. You know, I'm not going to argue with somebody about the due diligence I've done for six years for this district with not one dollar coming to me. But I'm going to say we should have a realistic conversation. And the idea that the that the taxpayer, that the public owes you something no, special the way beyond. Taxpayers pay the state. The state pays the school. No, the taxpayers passed a bond and an override yeah. to, to save your benefits in part and to give you raises. Right? Yeah. And that's not what it costs. I, mean, I am going to ask just one at a time for speaking. Okay. Um, but I disagree with framing this as an entitlement issue. Anybody should be able to rely on their contract. If you enter an agreement into a written contractual agreement with anyone, you should be able to rely on those terms. So that's, that, that is not, I'm Are sorry, that is here? not. They, that Aren't our contracts year to year? Yes. Yes. Okay, so, so then they can change year to year. Right. But this is policy that those contracts were based on that they agreed to. These are these are policy terms. You can I can pass this down if you'd like to look at them. But when the contract language changes and people sign the contract, then the policy changes. But you were told. Thank you. I appreciate what you do. Okay. Then I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. So. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to circle back to the football stadium. No, let's stay on topic. We're not. No. No, it's not. Yes, do I have a question? I just wanted to say that legally you probably don't have to honor what you said, but I think as a board, I think that's kind of what you were getting at. Morally, we do have a responsibility. And yes, we do get benefits, but again, I don't think anyone not just anyone could survive an education for 30 years. It's a tough, tough field, as all of us here can say. So we expect you know, you to pay a million dollars to us. No, we just want some acknowledgement, I think, for what we've given blood, sweat, and tears um, over the 25, 30, 35 years that we've all worked so hard for the kids in our community. We stayed, and we didn't have to. We had options when we hit the 15-year mark or so that we could say, hey, maybe we should go somewhere else. We didn't. We made that choice to stay in Lake Havasu. And I think we just all want that to be honored. And just um, when there's lots of numbers getting thrown out, just remember the people and the faces um, of the people who are still here or were here and worked 20, 30 years. Just remember us in all the debates and discussion. I think that's all we're really asking for. And and I think everyone on this board, I, I guess I'll speak for them and then they can speak up if I'm overstepping. They do, they do honor your work and appreciate it and value it. And I think people would recognize that you are profession, professionals who are not perfect, paid as if you're professionals. Um, but I think words are kind of empty. It's not about just honoring you with words, but also with benefits and a, a, salary that you can live on. So, yes? Just to make a point of clarification, in regards to when all of this came about. So 2005, I had been personally within the district over 10 years. At that point, at 10 years, as educators, we do look at, hmm, do we stay or do we go? What benefits is it for me to stay and what benefits is it for me to go? Because at that point, at 10 years, I don't, nothing, nobody honors my time. So if I'm gonna move, I'm gonna move at 10 years. Because wherever I go at that time, they honor 10 years of service. Now, they only honor five. <laughs> Anywhere you go, pretty much, if that's the case. But, so when it turned into that 15 years, I've already been here. I would lose Arizona retirement. There are those things that you have to consider. And when it's 500, and I believe it's, you know, 500 from the actual amount that's the same as a employee, retiree, and then it was a little bit more, and then a little bit more. And so now we're at this point of, and I do appreciate, Mike, your numbers. I, I didn't even think we would even have that conversation today. So I do appreciate that. I appreciate the board even considering it. And so I just need you to know that, yes, it's a contract, and we sign it every year. But when I sign that contract, I have to think, 
I'm going to lose my ears and go somewhere else, or I'm going to stay committed to this community and invite this to my home. So. Um, yeah, you guys got to remember there's some hard feelings about the last administration. And we do appreciate you guys for what you have done over the last five years with the raises and everything else. Um, Mr. Kenner, can I ask you to stand? I'm sorry. I, I, can, I just can see or hear better if I can see you. I'm, sorry. I'm Claude Sanders. I'm the principal of Havasu Bike. Um, yeah, like I said, there's been a lot of hard feelings for years and years about what happened a long time ago. And most of you guys weren't involved in any of it. Um, None yeah, of us were. We have appreciated <laughs> very much that we have seen some increases in that. Um, the problem I think that I have with it is there's another three million dollars that are going to come back into the district is that looking at being reinvested into the insurance because it's already paid into the insurance to no. help or is that something that's not I, I, can, I can give a little bit of clarification to that um, Arizona revised statute I think it's 15-382 don't quote me on it but I was looking at it the other day and it states specifically in paragraph C that if the trust is dissolved, then those monies would then have to go back to the district in the form of a property tax reduction. So what would happen, more than likely, we'd have to get legal counsel to finally give us you know, their, their writing and their official, official letter stating that that's what we're going to do. Um, that money would come back to m and but then it would be in the form of a property tax reduction, meaning that we would then receive less less cash from property tax owners um, to help offset that. So it would it would end up being a wash because while that money would then uh, be removed out of the Wells Fargo bank account that's separate for the EBT, it would now go to the county. Uh, but then again, like I said, that would have to be offset by a reduction of property tax. So it really doesn't help us at all. It, it comes back to M and O to be able to spend it how we'd like to spend it because it goes back into the general fund. Um, but again, that comes in the form of a reduction of property taxes. So it's not the earmark just for uh, benefits for the future. The way the statute is currently written now, we need to make sure that through legal that we get the full legal interpretation of that. But in consulting with our auditors as well, that's that's generally the practice that is that is mostly followed. Uh, the, only, the only reason why I'm asking, Mike, is because it seems like we've already spent it once on the insurance. So it's kind of just sitting there, and that's why I was asking, because if we've already spent it once on the insurance, shouldn't it stay with the insurance if it could do that? And that's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna receive clarification on because there is an internal revenue fund, an internal fund service fund, I should say. It's like a, a 950 fund account that's broken off separate. And if we can take that money and show that we're depositing it right into that internal service fund, that's separate from MO and any other fund, uh, there may be, again, it's gonna have to be up to legal uh, as they interpret the law to see if that money, if those monies can be put there, and then we can then spend from the 950 account to help subsidize our medical insurance going forward. I don't see that as being an option the way statute is written, but I've heard that there's been others who have tried to do that. I don't know how successful they've been. So and that fund, sure we we're required to hold some of those dollars in reserves for uh, claims, but not reported claims. And that's why there's that wind down of 18 months. Oh, gotcha. And so we have to wait. I mean, because we've got a lot of um, tail claims, they call them. So, because sometimes it actually take 12 months to get paid out. So, so Aaron said there's like three million, because that's, that's about what the account has now, give or take, you know, the interest rate that's in there. So, as those claims get funneled in and funneled out, that's that's that wind up. So it's got to cover us for the next 18 months. It's got to, it's got to make sure that okay. the very, very last claim gets paid out. There's zero claims coming in. There's zero <coughs> claims pending. And then whatever that final number is, and, there, and there's no more reserves. Right. So once that number is final, then... Then it comes back to the district. Then it comes back, and, and right. it's not... It can't follow... It can't follow the district into the new 
EBT because it, it can't be, um, because then it would be shared by the other entities and that wouldn't be fair to us. That's kind of the easiest way to think about it. Because those dollars don't belong to them, they belong to the district. So. And, and I was shocked to hear that we had $3 million of potential carryover. One of the, one of the, the first capital report I saw sitting here was uh, 600000 uh, and And you've got to remember where we've been with the EBT and why it's been so rocky. It, it, it literally, if you look at something that spends about $5 million give or take every year, uh, and you have $600,000 in the bank in the fiscal year, broke is I think the appropriate term for that. Uh, so, so there's been quite a bit of, of how do we fix this? Let's get those reserve balances to, to some level where they make some sense uh, and so on. And so there, there has been quite a significant amount of money put into this and quite a lot of thought put into this. How, how do we construct things? And so uh, very important to realize that this is not a, gosh, the world's crashing down around us and abandoning it. Literally, how do we bring some stability to district costs? Is, is, is I think the prevailing thought process in our case. And I just wanted to say that I apologize for being snarky and sarcastic. Um, and I want to explain that April 19, 2016, when this room was filled with teachers and staff that were upset, that's where the work began. So, at a minimum, there should be some value in the effort that people in this room have taken to get us to a place where we can even have this conversation. And this option just became available a week ago. This has been the most transparent board and administration that this district could ever ask for, giving real information in real time. So, sorry I was not professional, you know, I'm a human and I have emotions and feelings too. And so I'm sorry I took that out on you, but I do, do want to point that out. We're having a real conversation with real options before us, and there's been a track record that at least, you know, they will now deal with this, but that John and I have been on this board, and even before John was on the board, there's been a track record of looking out for staff. I'm just going to say that. Can I get clarification on the trust bylaws? Because 13.05 remaining monies states, trust shall be paid or used for the continuance of one or more of the benefits of the character hearing above uh, contemplated until such monies have been exhausted. That's in regards to the remaining monies that it's in the trust. Right. So I didn't know so, when you're saying that it goes to. So thought process for you on that. Uh, and again, this is all continuing on legal interpretation. Um, but we pay the trust money out of m &M. And so when you, when you start talking about uh, the liabilities of the trust, is those liabilities of the trust are retired. And we hit a point where we can actually do a final dissolution of that entity. Uh, that money would then come back into m, into m, &M because that's where the money originated. So, so basically, it's a circular, circular thought that the uh, taxpayer money isn't double dipped, in essence. Although we don't look at it that way, that's the way the law is written. And we did that a few years ago. I think it was my first year in this, in this position when we had uh, excess debt service from a retired bond. And what we had to do is take out 700000 and we reported it as um, showing a negative um, which adjusted the primary property tax down slightly because those monies went from debt service to MNO. So then what happened is that it slightly it was just a point something whatever percent. But nevertheless, that 700000 went from a debt service fund that was completely untouchable other than paying debt uh, in the form of bond back into MNO to where it was completely under our control to be able to spend that however we wanted. But because of that, it had to come in the, in the form of a property tax reduction to all of us who are property tax owners. So it's, it appears, without you know legal's you know final word on it, that this would be it would be the same type of a scenario. Yes, um, I think that's something you were talking about, Lori. Um, you were talking about like the seventy thirty, and I was listening to you writing, but is that that 
seventy thirty, that would be applied towards the retiree. Has there been any discussion, or or maybe I misunderstood? What about the dependent <coughs> dependent coverage costs? So the so the original just the proposal that I put out there in the form of a discussion point, or at least a jumping off point, was seventy percent of the retiree only premium medical premium. Right. So that would be, um, you know, in, in that nine thousand dollar range right. instead of the four thousand that we're con currently contributing. But there has not been at this point any other discussion other than that. So like similar to what we're doing now, where you can use that four thousand. If you have a family, then it's still four thousand in the current structure. If you're a retiree, it doesn't matter if you're just a retiree only or a retiree with a family. The maximum benefit from the district is still four thousand plus the eighteen hundred ASRS. And actually, you get another hundred and ten dollars. I think it is from ASRS for having a dependent. Um, but at this particular point, my my jumping off point was seventy percent. Just to at least, um, I think that's sustainable at this particular point. I'm, I'm trying to look, uh, everything I do, I try to have a short-term and long-term view. Uh, that was part of the reason why I, I think a percentage would be fair. So we're not sitting here and trying to um, revisit this topic year after year after year. And we can just see how long that, that is sustainable. But that would only be, we would only be talking about the retiree premium. Correct. There is one of my concerns is that the retiree, spouse, child, family premium is a 120% increase, approximately 100 to 120% increase over what an employee cost would be. So, for example, right now I I have a family plan, so I pay whatever the numbers I pay. Probably should know it, but you know we have that number. It's like 24,000 or something. Right, okay. but that would now be an extra $1,100 per month simply because I'm a retiree uh, versus if I was an employee, I would not have to pay that. So strictly because I carry tenants, it's, a, it's like I said, it's a humongous increase. So anyone in here that carries a spouse, a child, or whatever, the, their dependent coverage is, I don't know how to say it insane. I mean, it's, it's not even, it's an it's an astronomical number, and I just didn't know if that was something that was being looked at or discussed because that is a concern for well, myself and I know many others. I mean, granted, the retiree part of it I agree, but there's a whole other portion of this that again, well, I, I'm going to go back to no, other things, but but I mean, it's it's a thousand dollars a month, eleven hundred more per month. More, not not more. So I mean, that's more than a hundred percent increase. And when we saw these rates just a few days ago, right? Uh, that's why we needed to have this discussion uh, because clearly there there are some differences between the two the two proposals. Uh, there are definitely pros and cons to each, uh, and that's why we need to have this discussion. And that's why in crunching these numbers. <coughs> Uh, clearly, the jumping off point that I'm proposing helps to definitely offset that that much added expense if we went with an AEBT on, that, on the behalf of the retiree only. Retiree. Okay, so uh, that's right. what I thought I was understanding, but I wanted to make sure that those numbers are retiree only. That has nothing to do with the dependent. I mean, I'll be honest. I I really liked all the numbers of the NAEBT in general. I mean, I love the blue card. You know, I, I think overall it's good. Uh, like I said before, if I had one sticking point, it's the massive difference in retiree rates. And it's just, it's so crazy to me that on June 30th, I pay one amount, and on July 1st, I pay literally thousands more per month, or a little over a thousand more a month. And yet, I'm the same age, and my dependents are the same age. Has nothing to do with anything other than the fact that I now said, "Oh, I'm a retiree." And, and I think that, that goes to the, the comment next to you as well. But I think Mr. Collins pointed that out that these these rates over the last few years, those of us who have who've seen the EBT in action, 
uh, over the last couple of years uh, are now seeing real data from an actual actuary who uh, does this for a living, who actually looks at trends and, and looks at uh, just floating amounts of time to actually see what revenue expenditures look like over 12 month periods going forwards and backwards in all different directions. I and mean, he looks at things, he, he really likes numbers. I, mean, he, I like them, but he really likes numbers. Uh, but, um, we actually have real data to actually look at and, and, and make informed decisions, which at times is, it, it works in our, in our favor. And then there are times where I get an email and open it up and I think that there's a typo when I look at that retiree only line because it's so far out of alignment from what the normal people are used to seeing um, that there has to be some type of an explanation. And Mr. Collins um, mentioned that there are risk factors associated with it and, and, and how those actuaries actually set those rates. There's a funding formula or a formula for that. If I may feedback on that. But Again, I'm the same age, my parents are the same age, and if I'm an employee, the risk isn't there. <coughs> if I'm a retiree, the risk is there. I mean, it's literally, if I'm an employee and I stay an employee, I do not have to pay those observatory rates. But if I retire, just because I retired, I'm the same age, I'm the same place, I'm the same tenants, that, that now all of a sudden makes me a higher risk. I think that's one of the reasons we were asking how they base that value. Is that based on a one-year-old, which I am, I'm about my age, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll be 52. But, I mean, and I, I don't, this isn't it, but there will be people in the district who are older than I am that will pay cheaper rates for their dependents than I would pay simply because I said, hey, I'm going to retire. And so I think that's my concern is that that's how, I mean, whatever way, I mean, and I get numbers too, because I do love yeah. them. Yeah. And, uh, but it, it's more that mentality of it. I, I do see the risk values, I get that whole concept, but I also have a hard time with the, the literal, if I'm here, I pay this much, but if I'm here, I still pay this much. Like you're being penalized. Well, I'm penalized for, after the 30 years I'm retiring, I feel like I'm being penalized because I retired. Simply because I retired, it's not because of my age, or anything else, or my dependents, or anything else. Christy, I'd like to, to speak on behalf. I have been recently retired from the city, and the way the city and businesses do look at that, the district is providing benefits, and they are compensating by what they made the choice when we look at the benefit to be able to support our employees. That's a service that they're providing as far as that being part of our compensation for the employees who are working to be able to actively recruit and be able to take care of our employees. But the benefit does change for the city and it does change for most employers in most districts. And our policy currently has never supported the dependent coverage for, for employees once they retire. So that's not something we've done. So it's not a service or a benefit that's been available to our employees in the past. Um, I do know the city changed, they subsidized their dependent coverage very highly. Very high. And upon retiring, where I used to have little insurance, I no longer because I couldn't afford it because it reduced quite a bit um, with him retiring. <coughs> I'm not sure that, maybe I'm misunderstanding the conversation myself. So I guess it's not that she's really asking you to subsidize for children now that she's retired. It's why is that calculation? Because just not you know just looking at the <coughs> number with no subsidizing, the number for her same 15 year old child that number is not that number is changing significantly. Not the fact that it's being subsidized or not being subsidized. So is there any way that those calculations can be reconsidered? So so you run into you run into a, a large issue with that. What you're talking about is in insurance and in risk is you're talking about a closed group. So there is a finite number of retirees in that pool. Right, so it's not just age, it's size. It's size. It's and and that, that's, what, that's why when you start looking at, at what the district is experiencing for numbers and, and increases, that's why getting this into a bigger group and a wider pool stabilizes those numbers. The same works for that. Also, 
whether it's 100% true or not, there's going to be a perception of age that goes along with that that may or may not be 100% fair. Right. So you've got a closed aging population is the way that this is looked at. Um, it's not looked at dependence as much as it is the top end of that population. Um, is it fair? No. No, it's not. Um, is insurance rating in general fair for most people? Probably not so much. Uh, but because it's that closed group. Um, and I understand, you know, we, we've had teachers that have retired early and they're on PREO uh, and they're, they're working at 90% of their base pay on one hand and they're getting their retirement benefits on the other. And that's a calculation they made based on a, a preset supposition. And I, and I understand how a change can, everybody's going to inhale real quick and go, oh my goodness. Um, but with that said, um, what do you do? I mean, it, it, welcome, to, welcome to the fun of everything. I, I have things in my life that work this way, and I just go, oh. I got to pay what, I got to do what. And it just, it's the way that the, the cookie crumbles some days, and I understand the angst in that. I really do. Um, but the reason why the rates are high is it's it closed, closed group, um, hopefully shrinking group on top of that. The, the bonus here is three years out. This is all going to be reevaluated if we make this move to the Northern Arizona Employee Benefit Trust. Um, and it's a locked rate. It's not an, an increasing rate. So there's, <coughs> as bad as it is, there's some stability in the rate there. And if the claims experience is not out of line with what the general population is, uh, there's that opportunity to lower the rate or conjoin it with the standard employee rates. Can I say one more thing while I'm at your ear? I know that we were talking about 70 percent, you were saying something about 75, you were saying something about 80, but the one thing we didn't say was Rx and dental. And I, I'm a little concerned that those would be something that comes out of the retiree's pocket, my own, but retirees, because dental health is one of the closest things to body health. And if you aren't having a way to go to the dentist. If, if, if I may, because I understand that concern as well. Um, it's my understanding that the plans are identical for both the employee and the retiree. Is yeah. that correct? For not what he not for medic for dental and vision. Yes. 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 Okay. Dental and RX are together. Dental and vision is separate. So all four of those are in English. Yeah. Okay, so maybe I'm so you mean regular okay. employees aren't going to get RX and vision I'm sorry, dental and vision either? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody, everybody we're saying that the money amount stays the same Retirees under the current EBT or the NABT, NABT. Right, but, what, but, 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 both, but both sides of the plan include. <coughs> okay, because I thought Mike had said that this is what I heard, that the suggestion was that they pay 70% or subsidized, 70% of our insurance, and we would have to purchase our own, we be us, Retirees would have to purchase our own dental. No, the, no, no. The seventy percent calculation would be based on the medical prescription drug line. Gotcha. That would be the seventy percent in which the district would then apply that district contribution. So we would calculate that based off of the medical prescription drug line. Gotcha. Now, in the past, and this is where we might need to seek some clarification here next week. I'll be attending that meeting that, that Mr. Collins spoke about. From what I'm hearing and from what it looks like in, in the document that uh, was placed before us with the NAEBT, it appears that vision and dental are not really options. It's, it's a package. It's everything. Currently, the way it's structured, you have to have medical in order to have vision or dental coverage. You can elect, you can elect dental only, with, but you have to have the medical attached to it. You can have medical and vision, or you can have all three. Um, it looks like, and we'll get more clarification here in the coming days, it looks like, according to NAEBT structure, that it's all all okay. done. Okay, I just misunderstood that part. Thank you. He, he's, and I do remember him saying that, that all benefits must be taken. We, yeah. our, our trust, we have, we have to take all of those. So we can't say, well, we want the medical and, and prescription, but we don't want the vision. 
on the, in the new NADPT. That's right. that's what I right. that's what I'm interpreting. Right. We have to take all the benefits that. that are being made available. Our current structure allows us to pick and choose, but we do have to have medical in order to pick dental or vision. We can't just pick uh, vision and then not have medical. We have to have medical and then choose uh, vision and dental as options in our current district EBT. It looks like an EBT though, it's a, it's a total package. You, get, you just get it all, you don't get to pick and choose. Yes. So I just want to piggyback off of something John was saying. So if it is a possibility that in three years there may be some adjustments to those rates based on that, is that something that the district could look at doing is helping out during those three years till we get to that at least hopeful point for those of us with dependents on the retiree? Can you, I, I, I missed the second part of, of what you just said. So after, if you so, <laughs> John had said that after those three years, it looks like that they will reevaluate possible rate changes, good, bad, and possibly even bring back that in, keeping those, instead of those retirees being separated, that we could be back in with the, the main group. Is it possible during those three years then that the district could look at helping us out with, I guess, subsidizing? at least to a point, some of those exorbitant rates. I don't know if that's something that can be considered. Christy, yeah. in the, the NABT, there's no retirees, period. That's never going to change. So well, three years. Well, there are. found out there are. Well, no. No, I'm no. saying the NABT, right now, they're, they're, the cities don't have retirees in there, right? No, they have a closed well, group. No, closed group, right. Any but, plans but, coming but going, the group. going forward. Right. They don't provide that service. Right, forward. and so three right. years from now, it's not going to be an option okay. to add retirees. Right. Similar to us, we, we stopped that eligibility back in 2005. Right. So we, those of us like myself who missed it by three months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be clear, because I have people asking me, there will be basically no assistance on any of that. It will simply only be for retiree only. Is the district's plan? As, as currently presented, okay. yes. But you know, the rationale behind that is we're looking at you know half a million dollars increase just on this plan alone compared to the state of the course with what we currently have about six hundred and eighty thousand, like I mentioned. So that's five hundred thousand in new money. Um, we're, we're expecting that we're going to have the last 5% of the governor's 20 by 2020 proposal. Uh, I mean, 500000 is a lot of money towards benefits. So now we have to look at what's, what's going to be left over uh, in, in the form of salaries and other compensations. I just want to make sure I wasn't misunderstanding. Yeah, as, as currently presented in, in the numbers that I worked up here, um, again, this is a work session. So. Right. But there was, I just want to make sure there's no other things out there that I was missing. No, not, not currently. No, 500000 is going to replace the 600000 It's not going to 500000 is new. It's an increase in expenditure. So based on what we're paying to date, mm -hmm. with going to the NAEBT, the, again, we're, we have roughly um, almost $400 in additional employee-only uh, contributions okay. that the district has to make. Okay. So that's $200,000 in new money when you're, when you're multiplying that by 530 employees. Um, again, just the continued dependent um, subsidies, then the retiree proposal of 70%. That's going to um, bring about another $200 and some odd thousand dollars. And, new monies that the district's going to have to contribute uh, for the retiree subsidy, so it brings it up to about $500,000. Okay, thank you. I need to fix my notes. <laughs> and that's compared to if we stay with the LH uh, USD trust, it would be uh, just under $700,000. Okay. So that's positive. Even so it's, it's still positive. Still have to come up with it, but it's less than the Okay, that's right. Thank you. We're definitely paying more next year. We just don't know how much in which program we go with. 
<laughs> Is there more discussion on this particular topic? I just have a question. Have we done any calculations about, um, I mean, I know that the district has to, if we move into this trust, contribute 75%, correct? 75% for employee, 25% uh, for the Yeah, at least 80% for the employee. Right now we're 100%. We're 100 I understand that. Really I understand that. Um, but have we talked at all, or have you? thought at all. I know we've talked about it for quite a few years, um, but have you thought about what it would look like, what the numbers would look like if we asked for that contribution from the employees, that 20%, and then what, what the numbers would look like in terms of how we would increase compensation in order to cover that? Does it, am I making sense? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, I, I haven't put it down on paper yet, because like I said, this came as a, as a shock, uh, as, as it was just presented as an option. Uh, I don't think any of us saw that coming, uh, but, but maybe two weeks ago. Uh, but I am looking at it from, from basic math and from, from looking at it, it looks like um, if there's going to be something pushed back onto the employee, there would have to be an equal compensation, I would right. think, in the other direction. So it would really kind of be a, a revenue neutral, uh, maybe a, a wash. However, that would not, um, it may not impact the employee in a positive manner. I have to look at that part of it just because it's from a pre-tax situation versus a taxable situation. So if we're giving them more, they're taxed higher, but then they're paying for their own benefit. So I'd have to look to see how what the pre-tax outcome would look like to see if that truly would be a benefit. I, I think it would be an interesting exercise just to look at it because one of the things we heard was we didn't get paid as much and we lost retirement. And so maybe there's an offset in there where it may not mean as much in the paycheck initially but down the road with the state retirement system there may be a benefit there yes because your retirement is based on your highest earnings correct okay so having more in your paycheck than that okay it will also increase the contribution to asrs on both sides as well so. So basically, we're looking for the board to discuss and determine whether um, you would like us to move forward and agendize this for a vote on a special session next week. I would think so. I would like that, but are we going to provide the options that we're looking at so that, because I don't want to have a meeting where we're voting where people aren't looking at the same thing that we're looking at. One thing I might suggest is creating a PowerPoint that people can look at, because I, I do think yeah. it's... We, I have this already on PDF, so we, we could put those up on the next meeting. Okay. And do you want more than one option, like the 70%, 75%, those kinds of things? <coughs> I think I, it's good for yeah. people to be able to visualize what their options are and, and understand the options that are in front of us. I mean, it's the five of us voting, um, and I think we should each be able to defend our vote. So yes, to answer your question. Then my, then my last question for the board would be, um, on the 18th, would you be available at 5 o'clock for a special session? Yes. So that is the next board meeting day of the week from um, Cheers to What time? Five o'clock since our regular meeting starts at six. An hour? I know, I'm going to say that. I'm not sure that that's. that's I can't. Bushful. <laughs> um, would it, do you think it would be more beneficial going to another day or spend two hours at four o'clock?
uh, any type of access that somebody who's not invited uh, may, may try to, to come to our facility and try to, to have access to our facilities. So the, really the, the controversial point or the, the point of discussion is whether or not uh, in our front office settings in the front counter area do we want to move in the direction of putting glass a glass entryway, a glass structure uh, over top of our uh, front office counters and then engage people through glass and pass-throughs uh, in order to, uh, one, have a secure point of access to eliminating people from just walking freely down the hall in the form of doors and buzz through uh, uh, entries and then also restricting any type of un unwelcome access via jumping over a counter should somebody be that aggressive. Uh, I, I know this kind of can be a topic of, of um, sensitivity with people because uh, there may be those who live in a, in a very safe area for the most part. So when we're having these discussions, I, I want to be clear that we're not just addressing something that we see on TV, on the news, that makes the national news in the form of, of, a, of a major tragedy, uh, although that's part of it because we just never know. Uh, but we're also addressing just the, just the overall security and access to our facilities. As a former principal, <coughs> um, the greatest threat that I saw on several occasions uh, had to do with child custody disputes. So you know, we're not just talking about weapons and things that could actually you know, hurt or kill people. We're also talking about the weapons in the form of physical violence or, or whatever it may be, uh, and, or, or taking and abducting a child, and even if it's their own, um, that's, that's something we need to consider. So as we're talking school security and addressing points of entry, that's also something that I'd like us to keep in mind. We're not just talking about a gun or a knife. So the topic really, I think we have a really good overall plan and as we start to move forward with it. We'll show you visuals as to what, what we're proposing. Uh, but I'm also <clears throat> hesitant and, and giving too much detail on public meeting because uh, I, I don't want to show our cards either. And uh, I don't want to make a lot of things visible, even though for the most part we're very secure. Uh, but I definitely don't want to show any weaknesses either. Uh, I don't know. We need to just trust that, that we as a district are, are identifying them and we'll address them. Uh, but the conversation is do we, do we go as far as putting up a glass um, partition there to separate you know, the individual coming into the office and, and those who are employed behind the counter? On any given day, any individual so determined can breach any security time and of temperament to do so. The real question is, is what barriers do you put up to deter the average person from having that ability to breach it? So we don't have a legal requirement like a, a medical office. We still have confidentiality requirement. <coughs> medical offices it's almost an understood thing now that you should have the glass separator uh, for patient confidentiality and those things because there are phone conversations going on, you're working on paperwork and things of that nature. I just wonder, is there a way that we can accomplish what we want to do without putting a full partition in? Like what? Well, first I wouldn't use necessarily glass. I, I think a glass partition can be easy and breach where, say, a, a Lexan partition will be a little bit harder to get through. I'm sorry, uh, I want Lexan? I don't know. Plastic. Oh. Um, but could we, could we raise it so that a standing adult of average height could look over it and interact without completely cutting off that human interaction? And, and that's part of the design we have we have taller counter space, but then we also have to have ADA access as well. So like in a bank, there, there has to be a, a certain area that is 
low enough so that they can accommodate someone in a wheelchair or some type of a, an assistive device. So different thought process on ADA because ADA <coughs> you you have to have a lower workspace for that individual. Um, but could that workspace be off camera? I can check with the architects on that to make sure they're in compliance with it. I, it's one of the things in, in my operation, I have a full height counter, uh, but part of the ADA things that we did is we have standard counter height and then we have lower counters out in, in the showroom area that actually brought us into ADA compliance because it, ADA is about an accommodation and that accommodation can happen uh, either directly at that counter or it could happen out in the workspace. So if you had a, if you had a, and I'll just, I'll pick on how to see life for a minute. Uh, because you have the counter and you have the, the closed door with the push lock on it. And then you have a table on that opposite wall up by the front, which would actually qualify as an ADA accommodation. Because you could go out there and work with uh, someone who would have a disability or a handicap uh, that would keep them from using that full size counter. I suggest that you, uh, we meet with the administrative assistants. Um, they know how that office works. They know what the needs are. They know the things that, that they would love to have, but they don't. I mean, they can just you know, they have a picture of that, and, and the principals as well. Um, but certainly, the administrative assistants could give you a good advice. I think. And we, we've so already started to have, have, have those conversations okay. because there's. No greater input than, uh, than someone who has boots on the ground and, and are right there in, in the trenches. So we've already started that, and it's and, it, and it's mixed. There there are those who would who would like the idea of having uh, some type of a glass structure. There's the materials are they, they vary. There can be um, laminates or uh, uh, some type of, of, of film that's put on there to prevent or at least help greatly reduce the shattering impact and, and the penetration through the window. So there's a lot of different um, materials including bulletproof glass and uh, you know we, we, we'll get, we can get quotes on, on whatever um, we feel uh, we need to get a quote on but I think the major discussion is just do we do we want that in our district? Do we want to have that as the standard or are we comfortable with um, doing all that we think we're doing, I mean, all we can in a reasonable manner, and then move forward with it? I, I know that no matter what we do, there will be those who think we didn't do enough, and the, like I mentioned before, and those who will think we did way too much. So I, I like the balance in the middle still. Uh, <coughs> I'll give you another thought. What does the secondary point of security look like in school? <coughs> So in other words, your primary point of security is the, is the choke point in the front. So if somebody gets past the choke point of the front, what's the plan and how does that next level secure? <coughs> well, then it falls back onto our just our, our drills that we do on a monthly basis within the district. But I'm I'm just I'm just thinking if somebody were to jump the counter, how do you keep them from getting further in the building? No, it, that, that, that kind of lot you well, once they get into the counter area, then yeah, there's. There are other doors that they would have to go through that they wouldn't necessarily be locked because that would be an office door exiting out of the hallway. But it, but it, but it may be something where, and, that, and that, that's actually a good observation, that an electronic locking device is some type of access to the front office. Could they set it quickly? May, well, you would have a permanent mag lock. Well, on your second point, um, I think it depends on the site. For instance, if you were to jump the counter at uh, Starline, you would then um, have access to that office, but to enter into the hallway, there's a, another door that is locked during the school hours. Yeah, there are other facilities that pre they present their own unique challenges. True, but but the main the main thrust of good security is not prevention; it's to slow down an incident until until a proper reaction can occur. That's exactly right, and that would be the whole point to the glass windows to, to slow down. And I, I, I just from my from my take, I'm not a fan of the glass. I'm not a fan of, the, of, of an absolute partition, which is why I'm thinking how do we how do we stack the counter height to make it prohibitive? Yeah, I, don't, I definitely don't want 
to lose the, the human interaction, the human touch to it. Does anyone else have an opinion to offer? I'd like the idea of it being higher because it's higher rather than not go glass. You know, <clears throat> get complaints enough that schools are like prisons, and mm -hmm. that just takes that element even a step further. Someone said last you would want the plastic or no, no, just higher, 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 so okay, it's higher so somebody could easily just jump off. I just feel like if you jump onto the counter, it would be pretty easy to go over a partition, and like a partial. Well, it's at the piece. height it is now, but I'm like talking about counters versus ones. Mm -hmm. so so Part of, part of the renovation will be that the, even the, the counters will be completely yeah. So when you were to walk in to schools that you're familiar with, uh, what's existing right now will be eliminated and, and new structure, a new countertop will be put in place, the counter will be put in there. So what happens when it's kindergarten? <laughs> <Yeah. coughs> All right, hey, I disregarded your advice earlier about not being specific about the schools. I apologize yeah. for that. Um, I have something I just find, again, I'm, I work at Jamaica, and we walk through the front doors, and then there's the, the office and the counter, but there's hallways right there. Mm -hmm. So to put a piece of glass or plastic or whatever would help, you know, protect <coughs> the girls and the office, but... All, yeah, all, of that is, all of that is within the scope of work okay. to address... Yeah. All okay. of those points. Okay. Yeah. What without, is, without getting too specific, yeah, right, that's right. We we know those weaknesses and yeah. we're okay. gonna address all of that. Okay. What if there was a full glass partition but it had a window that you would slide open that was only accessible on the administrative side of the of the counter? So in other words, the person on one side of the counter couldn't open it, just the person on the inside of the school, the school employee. I, I, still, I still think that the minute we lose our human interaction, and, and I know we're trying to prevent against tragedies that, that have happened elsewhere, the moment we lose our ability to interact person to person, the minute that we wall it up, we lose something that we may never get back. And, and that is the ability to talk to each other as human beings. And, and, I, and I think there's a huge value to that. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it, Thunderbolt for years had was pink. And it, it carried the name, the pink prison with the kids. Um, we don't want that. We want to have warm, rich, inviting, people-friendly places where we send our kids. That's the warm and fuzzy side of the school. But the other side of that reality is uh, we want to also make sure that we protect our kids. And short of wrapping every kid in bubble wrap and Kevlar, which is highly impractical to do, um, we probably want to strike a balance between allowing ourselves to still be human, still be warm and inviting, um, and have a direct connection without something in between those human beings as much as possible, and the, um, and, and the protection levels that we're going to require that our schools have. Um, and so where is that balance? Uh, you know, um, one, of the, one of the things that I hate is when I go into a doctor's office, I walk up to the window, and it's Oh, somebody's that? here. And, and, you know, and then when you're done writing on a piece of paper, it closes back up. Well, we're back into our thing. We have to do that because of some of the federal, <coughs> federal law and rulemaking in place nowadays. But it creates a very impersonal system. And, and I think that for as much as we have these, these problems, you know, even with even with a parent that's just upset that they lost a court case and they can't see the kid, I think that we have to find that balance point. Um, and is there risk involved in that? There always will be. You're dealing with people. People are very unpredictable, wild animals, and, and, and it's just a part of it. But the question is, is where does that risk point balance? And if the risk point balance is that we don't have any tolerance for it, we're going to wind up in prisons. And if we accept all the risks, 
we're going to wind up with, with big problems in our schools and, and employee safety issues and kids' safety issues. So where does that balance? Does that balance at glass? Or does that balance at a high counter? Or does that balance at just leave it alone and let it go the way it is? I think somewhere in the middle there is, is the right thought process. And, and I think what we need to do is give Mr. Murray the input and go back to the architects and see what the architects have to say. We obviously want to, in this whole process, be ADA sensitive and 100% and, and compliant um, so that we're, we're accommodating people that we want to accommodate as we redesign counters and entryways and, and things of that nature. Um, but on the same token, you know, we want to make sure it's secure and safe and a lot of balancing to go on. I, I think that we're employing professionals in Mr. Murray and in uh, the architectural firm and we're going to get good advice and good guidance from them and it comes if we have concerns we can we can lay it out but I know this I know that if, if there's something that we don't like in a preliminary set of plans or or a final set that's going out to bid we can make those changes that's part of part of our final decision but it, I think guidance from Mr. Murray is what we're after right now yeah yeah there's like I said there's 50 50 split between districts uh, throughout the valley, half are doing it, seems like, and half are not. Um, so that's why I'm coming to the board and just seeking your input so that we we do it right. And I guess at the end of the day, if, if we determine that we need to make a change, then we make that change, even if it's after the fact. If we have nice counters in place, and for some reason we really feel that that needs to be um, addressed and, and we need to put glass in place, we can always add it at a later date if we if things got to that point where we to make that change. Is it possible to get a number of different, not just the recommendations from the architects, but also the different price points for different options? Mm -hmm. okay. Then yeah. that might guide our decision as well. And to, just uh, to speak briefly on, so what you said um, about it not just being a matter of security concern, but also confidentiality concerns, um, I hadn't thought of that before, but you're absolutely right. When I go to the doctor's office, I do, my doctor has the full glass partition, partition and the window, um, which I don't mind. I don't have the reaction to the whoosh that you apparently do. Um, I, I feel like that would address the security concerns and the confidentiality concerns and also give us a way to interact face to face with um, parents or other members of the public. The other thing is when I go to a doctor's waiting room, I interact with the receptionist and then I wait for a little bit in that room. People coming into the school rarely just sit there and wait in the room. So I feel like that's kind of a, a key difference as well. It, I'm sure it happens sometimes, but I think they're either admitted into the building or they take care of whatever form they came to fill out and then they leave. So I don't feel like the glass is quite the same as it would be in a waiting room where people actually wait. I actually, I actually, you know, if I've had an issue at school with one of my kids, I got boys, so that happens. They get older and, and, and so on. There are times that I wait and there are times that I chat. And and I can I can tell you uh, my two oldest went to Havasu by that's why I, one of the reasons why I know the school so well. I was also in the first class to go to Havasu by, which is another reason why I know the school so well. Um, but I, I, you know, if, if something's going on, there's there's conversation going on over that counter. There's human interaction, and I, I just, I, I just think there's a value in that. There's a value in receiving that information um, from from the AA on the other side of that counter, and and I think that if we lose that, um, what you do is you shut people off from that human interaction point when that glass gets closed is the question start coming to somebody's mind if they're an agitated state to begin with, we're just camping that up a little bit, in my mind. John, I have a question. At one point in this conversation, were we just talking about, I know he, Mike was kind of talking about a full glass. I know some medical facilities have a glass that has like a gap at the bottom and a gap at the top, so there's still that cut down of sound or there is some security would that even be considered too closed in your mind? Or would that be an open, somewhere compromise between not having it and then having it? I, I think what you want to do with it is you want to make it so that it is prohibitive for the average person to try and jump the counter. 
Um, on the confidentiality side, I, I think if, if we're mindful that we deal with confidential information and we're away from a front counter type of situation for it, um, I think that would get you to a point anyway where uh, we're maintaining confidentiality in what we're doing. Um, a lot of the confidential stuff that we deal with as well is more written than oral. Um, so so at, the end of, at the end of the day, you know, maybe a high counter and maybe about that much class over the top. So that there's still that <coughs> human presence as opposed to a big piece of glass in your face. So you came seeking guidance, did we give you a clear next step? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm good with that. I just, again, I think it proves the point that there's 50-50, there are those who will be in favor and those who maybe not, maybe don't think it's such a great idea, but whatever it is, it'll be a nice finished product. And if we need to make adjustments later on in the future, we can always do that. Is everyone okay with moving on to our next item? And our final item, I might add. Okay. So, I, I would be happy yeah. to hold that item uh, to another time. It's not urgent tonight, and I think it's more information that's given people. Okay. In that case, do we have any updates or announcements? I don't hear any. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Second. Second. Absolutely yes. Kathy Fox? Yes. Coco one? Yes. Archie Analyo? Yes. Lisa Lamont? Yes. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned.